Welcome to Brain Imaging Essentials Part 3, Brain Imaging Pathology. I am David Lee Gordon, Professor of Neurology. The learning objectives for Brain Imaging Essentials Part 3 Pathology are, upon viewing this presentation, learners will be able to distinguish normal and abnormal CT and MRI scans of the brain, identify acute blood on CT scan of the brain, define and identify mass effect on brain imaging, identify the lesions listed on this slide on brain imaging, identify cerebral infarctions on brain imaging in the following arterial territories, anterior cerebral, middle cerebral, posterior cerebral, ventricular stri, posterior inferior cerebellar, and watershed. In neurologic emergencies, the two most important findings on CT scan of the brain are acute blood and mass effect. Acute blood appears as white where it shouldn't be. Mass effect is compression of adjacent structures with possible midline shift and increased intracranial pressure. In the images on this slide, the red arrows point to acute blood. The yellow arrows point to mass effect manifested by compression of sulci and ventricles. The blue arrows point to mass effect manifested by midline shift, also called subfalcine herniation. Looking at the images from left to right, in the first image, the red arrow is pointing to a ball of white in the middle of the parenchyma. This is called an intracerebral or intraparenchymal hemorrhage. In the second image, the red arrows are pointing to white substance within CSF structures, cisterns, fourth ventricle. This is subarachnoid hemorrhage. In the third image, the red arrow is pointing to white outside the brain, between the skull and the brain. This is a subdural hematoma. And the yellow arrow is pointing to the compression of sulci adjacent to the subdural hematoma. This is mass effect. The fourth image shows a subacute infarction. This, in the subacute phase, <clears throat> there is significant edema resulting in mass effect. The yellow arrow is pointing to the compressed lateral ventricle, frontal horn of the lateral ventricle. And the blue arrow is pointing to midline shift as a result of the excessive cytotoxic edema from the subacute infarction. In the fifth and last image, the yellow arrows are pointing to the compression of sulci and ventricles as a result of this mass within the brain with significant vasogenic edema, and the blue arrow is pointing to the midline shift as a result of this mass and edema. So in general, the most important thing for any non-neurologist to find on a CT brain is either acute blood or mass effect. Further investigations can reveal the causes of the blood and mass effect, but the very first priority is just identifying these two possible pathologic conditions. Let's look more carefully at the imaging of intracerebral hemorrhage. Non-contrast CT scans are preferable when suspecting hemorrhage since contrast is white on CT, like acute blood, and thus may interfere with CT interpretation. In intracerebral hemorrhage, or ICH, acute blood is white, hyperdense, and is within the brain parenchyma, in this case, the right thalamus, as seen in this CT non-contrast axial view. Intracerebral hemorrhage, or ICH, location varies based on pathophysiology. Subcortical, or brainstem ICH, is usually due to chronic, and we emphasize the word chronic, hypertension. 
the four main locations for intracerebral hemorrhage due to chronic hypertension are the basal ganglia, specifically the lentiform nucleus or putamen, the thalamus, especially if the hemorrhage is on one side, the pons, and the cerebellum. Here are four images of ICH due to chronic hypertension. In the image on the left, the basal ganglia hemorrhage would be manifested by hemiparesis and other findings as well. In the second image, the primary source of the hemorrhage is in the thalamus, in the left thalamus, and it has ruptured into the ventricles. So there is secondary intraventricular hemorrhage, or IVH. Because the posterior limb of the internal capsule is just lateral to the thalamus, this patient would have hemiplegia as well as hemisensory loss. And because of the midline shift and intraventricular rupture, there would be bicerebral dysfunction and coma. The third image shows a large intracerebral hemorrhage within the pons itself. This patient would present with coma. And the fourth image shows a primary intracerebral hemorrhage in the cerebellum. The initial symptom would be a gait ataxia, cannot walk, but very rapidly these cerebellar hemorrhages can compress other structures such as the brainstem anteriorly, leading to decreased consciousness or even coma. Lobar intracerebral hemorrhages, that is to say, hemorrhages located in the outer brain, peripheral or cortical brain, are usually not related to hypertension. In the images, we see the possibility of hemorrhages in the frontal lobe, temporal, occipital, and parietal. And the actual left parietal lobar ICH seen on the image to the far right. The most common causes of these lobar hemorrhages are cerebral amyloid angiopathy, especially in older folks who might have some element of cognitive impairment or dementia, cerebral vein thrombosis, hypertensive encephalopathy, ruptured arteriovenous malformations or AVMs, bleeding tumors, and bleeding disorders. Cerebral amyloid angiopathy is the most common cause of lobar hemorrhages in elderly patients, particularly those with dementia or mild cognitive impairment. Cerebral amyloid angiopathy commonly causes microbleeds seen only on MRI, SWI, or SWAN before causing a larger lobar hemorrhage. Recall that SWI SWAN sequences show chronic blood, uh, that is to say hemosiderin, for the life of the patient. A 62-year-old man, in this case, has new onset focal impaired awareness, or complex partial seizures, due to a microbleed seen on MRI SWAN, but not on other MRI sequences. So note the image to the left, an MRI T2 flare shows large temporal horns, consistent with, and diffuse cerebral atrophy, consistent with perhaps a dementia, but no evidence of hemorrhage. Whereas the MRI SWAN on the right shows a microbleed, this black spot of hemosiderin, typical of cerebral amyloid angiopathy in the left temporal lobe. Although cerebral vein thrombosis is a clotting disorder, the increased pressure within the veins as a result of the thrombosis can lead to intraparenchymal hemorrhages within the brain. On this slide, we demonstrate common venous thrombus locations and the corresponding common parenchymal hemorrhage locations on a CT scan. To the far left, a transverse or sigmoid sinus venous thrombosis might result in a temporal lobe hemorrhage. A transverse or superior sagittal sinus thrombosis in the second CT might result in a, an occipital lobe hemorrhage. In the third image, the superior sagittal sinus thrombosis commonly results in a parasagittal frontal or parietal lobe 
thrombosis. And in the image to the far right, when the thrombosis involves the deep vein structures of the brain, patients tend to get bilateral thalamic hemorrhages. Let's now look at bleeding around the brain, subarachnoid hemorrhage. In subarachnoid hemorrhage, or SAH, acute blood is white, hyperdense, around the brain in the subarachnoid space, in this case, in the basal, cisterns, and fourth ventricle. It is very important for, to have a knowledge of normal CSF, cistern, and fissure anatomy. This aids in the recognition of subarachnoid hemorrhage on brain imaging. This non-contrast CT is from a different patient with subarachnoid hemorrhage. Can you identify the subarachnoid blood and the resultant mass effect? Knowing where the CSF structures should be helps you identify the subarachnoid blood. The CT scan actually shows blood in the third ventricle, labeled with A, in the sylvian fissures, labeled B, in the quadrigeminal plate cistern, dorsal to the midbrain, that's labeled C, and in the space above the tentorum cerebelli, labeled D. In addition, there is sulcal effacement. The sulci are not seen at all in this image due to the increased intracranial pressure that occurred as a result of the subarachnoid hemorrhage. Intraventricular hemorrhage, that is hemorrhage within the ventricles, sometimes called IVH, usually occurs as a result of an initial ICH, intracerebral hemorrhage, or subarachnoid hemorrhage. ICH originating in the thalamus or basal ganglia, for example, may extend into the ventricles. We often call this interventricular extension. And subarachnoid hemorrhage commonly occurs in the ventricles because the ventricles are part of the subarachnoid space. Here we see two examples of interventricular hemorrhage on CT scan. The, in the image on the left, the patient first suffered a primary thalamic intracerebral hemorrhage with subsequent rupture into the third ventricle and lateral ventricles. Thus, this would be called interventricular extension of the ICH. In the image on the right, the patient had a primary subarachnoid hemorrhage with interventricular extension. Note that blood in the lateral ventricles often layers flat due to gravity. Now let's look more carefully at the appearance of ischemic stroke or cerebral infarction on CT scan. In the first few hours to day of an ischemic stroke, the CT is often normal, though may instead show gray-white junction blurring or sulcal effacement. For distal M1 occlusions, gray-white junction blurring appears as loss of insular ribbon as seen in slice A on this slide. By day two of ischemic stroke, CT scan will show a dark area with mass effect, compression of adjacent structures, including CSF spaces such as sulci and fissures. This is how one differentiates a subacute infarction from an old or chronic infarction. In the subacute phase, there will be local mass effect compression of sulci, for example, whereas in a chronic or old cerebral infarction, the adjacent sulci will actually be bigger, larger, wider, due to atrophy. This is the non-contrast CT scan of a patient who presented four hours after developing global aphasia and right hemiplegia. Can you see the large cerebral infarction? Of course, if the patient presents with global aphasia and right hemiplegia, we are expecting a left cerebral infarction. On the normal unaffected side, the right side, one can see the normal gray-white junction. That is that distinct ribbon of cortical gray matter that is lighter in color, lighter gray than the 
subcortical white matter. One can also see normal sulci, normal wrinkles on that side of the brain of CSF. The affected left side, however, already at four hours, shows a large acute MCA territory infarction with blurring of the gray-white junction and sulcal effacement. Here is the same image again without labels. Do you now see the large acute cerebral infarction on the left? This non-contrast CT image is from the same patient with global aphasia and right hemiplegia four days after last known well. Subacute infarctions are more easy to detect on CT scan. Note the subacute infarction is dark or hypodense with mass effect. Notice the compressed lateral ventricle on the left. This darkness and mass effect is due to cytotoxic edema. The cells die and rupture in the infarction. And this occurs days two to five after ischemia and affects both gray matter and white matter. Notice on the other side, the right side, unaffected, still has normal lateral ventricles. Now let's look at different infarction patterns based on the arterial territory affected in ischemic stroke. As we proceed through each of the eight infarction patterns in this presentation, Note that the infarction patterns often give us good information regarding the possible etiologies of ischemic stroke. This patient presented with a sensory motor deficit involving the right leg only. Can you determine the arterial territory of this infarction and whether it is acute, subacute, or chronic? The CT scan shows a subacute infarction. Subacute because it is dark with some element of mass effect adjacent or at least no atrophy with enlarged sulcite next to it. This subacute infarction is in the proximal ACA territory involving the medial cortex, in this case, the medial frontal cortex. Proximal ACA occlusions involve the frontal lobe and may also involve the parietal lobe. More distal ACA occlusions only involve the parietal lobe. ACA territory infarctions are often due to large artery atheroembolus from an intracranial proximal anterior cerebral artery stenosis. This patient presents with aphasia, right visual field deficit, a left gaze preference, and a sensory motor deficit involving the right face and right arm. Can you determine the arterial territory of this infarction and whether it is acute, subacute, or chronic? This CT scan shows a subacute infarction, once again, because it is dark with mass effect and it is in the middle cerebral artery, or MCA territory, suggesting a distal M1 segment occlusion because it involves the cortex and spares the subcortex. This pattern is usually due to distal M1 occlusion by a cardioembolus or large artery atheroembolus from internal carotid artery stenosis. Distal M1 occlusion results in face and arm weakness and spares the leg. The earliest sign of acute distal M1 occlusion is blurring of the insular cortex, often called loss of insular ribbon. This patient presented with a sensory motor deficit involving the right face, arm, and leg, consistent with the pure sensory motor lacunar syndrome. The three lacunar syndromes that all viewers of this presentation should know are pure motor, pure sensory, and pure sensory motor. More advanced viewers, such as neurology residents and neurologists, should also be able to identify ataxic hemiparesis, dysarthria, clumsy hand, and hemibolismus as lacunar syndromes.
Can you determine the arterial territory of this infarction and whether it is acute, subacute, or chronic? This patient's infarction appears as a small black dot in the left cerebral hemisphere, specifically in the lenticulostriate or MCA penetrator territory in the subcortical white matter, in this case, the corona radiata. Small artery territory infarctions may be due to local thrombosis due to small artery disease or lacune, local thrombosis due to hypercoagulable state, large artery atheroembolus or cardioembolus. When due to small artery disease, these are called lacunar infarctions. One does not use the term lacune or lacunar when the small artery territory infarction is due to a cause other than small artery disease. Please note that it is nearly impossible to determine whether lacunar infarctions are acute, subacute, or chronic. This patient presented with a right visual field deficit and right hemisensory deficit involving the face, arm, and leg. Can you determine the arterial territory of this infarction and whether it is acute, subacute, or chronic? This patient's CT shows a subacute infarction, subacute because it is dark with mass effect. Note the compression of the atrium of the lateral ventricle on the scan. In the proximal PCA territory, proximal because it involves both thalamus and occipital lobe. Note that a distal PCA occlusion would spare the thalamus. Distal PCA occlusions are usually due to embolism, either cardioembolism or large artery atheroembolism. Pr proximal PCA occlusions may be due to either embolism or local large artery atherosclerosis in the posterior cerebral artery itself. This patient presents with neurobehavior deficits and visual field deficits with visual hallucinations bilaterally. Can you determine the arterial territory of this infarction and whether it is acute, subacute, or chronic? This patient's CT scan shows infarctions in the watershed territories primarily, as depicted by the three arrows. In this case, the watershed infarctions are worse on the left than the right, with concurrent left middle cerebral artery territory infarction outlined with the red broken line. This is going to be due to hypotension in a patient who also has a left internal carotid artery occlusion and right internal carotid artery stenosis. Watershed and border zone are equivalent terms. And please note that microemboli can also travel to arterial border zones or distal arterial territories and mimic a stroke due to hypotension. In general, motor, motor deficits are minimal to non-existent in watershed strokes because as one can see from the arrows, the watershed or border zones are anterior to and posterior to the primary motor strip in the frontal lobe. In this case, however, the patient may have had also a right hemiparesis because the left internal carotid artery was occluded, leading to both an MCA territory infarction on the left and the bilateral watershed infarctions. This patient presented with right arm weakness, a motor deficit of the right arm, and we show his MRI scan images. Can you determine the arterial territory of this infarction and whether it is acute, subacute, or chronic? This patient's MRI images shows a frontal cortex infarction in an MCA branch or middle cerebral artery branch territory that occurred recently, within a few weeks, since it is seen on both DWI and ADC, but is likely at least one to two days old since it also is seen on flare. A distal cortical pattern is most consistent with embolism from carotid artery, so-called large artery atheroembolism, or the heart, 
cardioembolism. This patient presented with a sensory motor deficit involving the right face, arm, and leg. And we show his MRI DWI scan. Can you determine the arterial territory of this infarction and whether it is acute, subacute, or chronic? This patient's diffusion weighted MRI shows an acute or possibly subacute infarction in the anterior choroidal artery territory, in the subcortical white matter, in this case, the posterior limb internal capsule. The anterior choroidal artery is a very small artery, not usually seen on CTA, MRA, or catheter angiography. It originates from the distal internal carotid artery, or less commonly, the proximal middle cerebral artery. Because it is small and comes off the ICA at a right angle, anterior choroidal artery territory infarctions are usually due to local thrombosis due to either small artery disease or hypercoagulable states. Though complete anterior choroidal artery territory infarctions may be due to embolic occlusion of the distal ICA. The anterior choroidal artery does supply the mesial temporal lobe, uh, and so when there's a complete anterior choroidal artery territory, there may be other less common anterior choroidal artery territory symptoms, such as hemianopsia, aphasia or neglect, and other lacunar syndromes. This patient presented with right facial pinprick sensory loss, a right Horner syndrome, and right hemibody ataxia as well as contralateral body pinprick sensory loss. We call this a cross sensory loss when it involves one side of the face and the other side of the body. And vertigo, nausea, dysphagia, and hoarseness. His MRI diffusion weighted image is shown on this slide. Can you determine the arterial territory of this infarction and whether it is acute, subacute, or chronic? This patient's diffusion weighted MRI shows an acute or at least subacute infarction in the territory of the pica or posterior inferior cerebellar artery involving the lateral medulla. Often, pica territory infarctions also involve the inferior cerebellum, though that is not shown in this patient's imaging. Pica occlusions are usually due to emboli from vertebral artery due to the process of large artery atheroembolism or the heart, cardioembolism. The clinical syndrome is called lateral medullary syndrome or Wallenberg syndrome. Now let's look at the appearance of non-penetrating traumatic brain injury on brain imaging. There are four main types of non-penetrating traumatic brain injury that we will review. Subdural hematoma, epidural hematoma, cerebral contusion, and diffuse axonal injury. In subdural hematoma, there is extra axial blood. The blood or hematoma is outside the brain, extraaxial. When the subdural hematoma occurs lateral to the brain, it layers, the blood layers concave to the brain in a crescent shape. When the subdural hematoma occurs in the midline along the fox, we call this a parasagittal location. Epidural hematomas are also extraaxial hematomas outside the brain. But they are associated with skull fractures and layer convex to the brain because they're due to an arterial tear. The cerebral contusions ca are, can either be on the side of the head trauma, we call that the coup side, C-O-U-P, French for strike, or contra coup, opposite the strike, opposite side of where the head trauma occurred. In this case, there is, there are intraaxial 
multiple small hemorrhages at the coup site due to the direct trauma and conjugu site due to opposite side of the brain striking the skull. Diffuse axonal injury occurs when there is a sudden acceleration deceleration injury to the brain. In this case, there are interaxial multiple small petechial hemorrhages at the gray white junction. This non contrast CT shows a left subdural hematoma. Subdural hematomas are due to closed head trauma without skull fracture, with tearing of bridging veins. They accumulate at variable rates from acute to subacute to chronic, and they layer along the dura like a crescent concave to the brain when they are lateral. Acute subdural hematomas are white on CT and cause mass effect. And CT without contrast is the best initial study to detect acute blood and to determine if there also happens to be a skull fracture, though in general, subdural hematomas are not associated with skull fractures. Now let's look at the appearance of subdural hematoma over time on a CT scan. On CT, blood is white or hyperdense acutely, but darkens over time. Subacute blood, days to weeks old, is gray or isodense and difficult to see. And chronic blood, weeks to months, is black or hypodense. In these three CT scan images from three different patients, one can see the different appearances of subdural hematomas over time. The image on the left shows an acute left subdural that is hyperdense or white. The middle image shows a subacute left subdural that is isodense or gray. Note that it is different to determine the difference between parenchyma and blood. One has to look very carefully at the lack of sulci going all the way to the edge or to the bone on the left side and how the cortex, the cortical ribbon is buckled underneath that subdural hematoma in order to determine that there is a subdural hematoma there. The image on the right shows a patient with two different subdural hematomas. There's a chronic right subdural hematoma that is black or hypodense, and then there's a left acute subdural that is hyperdense. Clearly this patient has had two episodes of head trauma at different periods of time. This CT without contrast is from a patient who has suffered two right subdural hematomas at different periods of time. The subdural hematoma chronic component is darker, hypodense, adjacent to the cerebral cortex. The subdural hematoma subacute component is a bit brighter. It's more isodense and is closer to the bone, lateral to the old chronic hematoma. Since subacute subdural hematomas are isodense with brain parenchyma, they may be difficult to detect on CT. Look for sulcal effacement and cerebral cortex that is buckled and does not extend to the skull. Chronic subdural hematomas are often asymptomatic, especially in older patients with brain atrophy. But acute bleeding into an old subdural hematoma may cause symptoms months after the initial trauma, causing initial confusion as to the cause of the patient's deficits. MRI brain can be very helpful for detecting subacute subdural hematomas. MRI brain without contrast is actually superior to a CT for subacute blood detection, since subacute blood is white on MRI, hyperintense due to methemoglobin, and gray on CT or isodense. Look at these two scans from the same patient on the same day. On the left is a CT scan, and you can see the adjacent scalp swelling outside the skull to show that there was head trauma. And you really barely see, if at all, the iso to hypodense subdural just underneath the brain, uh, just underneath the scalp swelling in the right hemisphere. The MRI flare more clearly shows the hyperintense subdural hematoma on the right. Unlike subdural hematomas, epidural hematomas are due to open head trauma, skull fracture, and tearing of the middle meningeal artery, and thus accumulate rapidly and typically form a bulge convex to the brain. This patient 
uh, for the image shown here, suffered severe head trauma with both subdural and epidural hematomas. The A labels the acute right subdural hematoma over the convexity, concave to the brain. B labels the acute subdural hematoma that is interhemispheric or parasagittal. And C labels the acute left epidural hematoma convex to the brain. Now let's look at the appearance of cerebral contusion with an associated closed skull fracture on CT scan. First note that changing the CT window or density in the radiology software facilitates identifying fractures. Let's look at these images, non-contrast CT axial view of a 60-year-old man who tripped and fell backwards with parietal occipital head trauma and subsequent complex partial seizure with secondary generalization. Slice B, showing the brain parenchyma window, shows scalp swelling outlined by the arrow at the trauma site, but does not show a fracture. When one changes the density window on the same slice, slice B, we call it the bone window, it shows the scalp swelling still at the white arrow at the trauma site, but also shows a non-displaced fracture, very subtle non-displaced fracture outlined by the arrow that is yellow with uh, black lines in it. The image to the right is the slice below the previous slice, a CT scan calling this slice A, again showing the brain parenchyma window. And it shows, interestingly, a contra coup lesion, a frontal contusion opposite the trauma site that is the cause of the patient's seizure. Now let's look at the appearance of an abscess, in this case a toxoplasmosis abscess, on an axial CT scan without contrast. Can you identify the four pathologic features listed on this slide? The arrow on this slide points to the center of the abscess itself. Note the vaguely hyperdense ring within the larger area of hypodensity. The dark areas around the abscess ring represents vasogenic edema. Vasogenic edema is due to mass lesions, typically abscesses or tumors, and represents blood-brain barrier disruption, and it only involves a white matter. That is because vasogenic edema is due to water leaking out of arteries, and when it leaks out into the brain parenchyma, it naturally goes to the less dense areas. The water cannot penetrate the very densely compact neurons of the cortex, basal ganglia, etc., the gray matter. Instead, it tends to permeate the more fluffy or less dense white matter. So in general, a great way to determine if edema is due to phasogenic or cytotoxic edema is to see if the edema stays only in white matter. If it only goes in white matter and does not go into gray matter, it is vasogenic edema, and one must be concerned about an abscess or tumor. The abscess and vasogenic edema in this patient have clearly caused mass effect with compression of the ipsilateral ventricle. This patient's abscess and vasogenic edema have also clearly caused mass effect with subfalcine herniation, or midline shift. In this case, right to left shift. The best way to determine if there is midline shift is to draw a line down the middle of the axial image. The best way to quantify the amount of midline shift is to draw a second line perpendicular to the first line, and then measure the for exact number of millimeters of shift across midline. On this slide, we see the axial CT scan with contrast 
for the same patient with a toxoplasmosis abscess. The CT scan with contrast more clearly shows the abscess with ring enhancement. Ring enhancement is the term used to describe when the wall of the abscess or tumor is hyperdense, that is to say enhances after IV contrast administration. Contrast enhancement is due to leakage of dye around the lesion and occurs as a result of blood-brain barrier disruption. Thus, lesions that cause vasogenic edema will also enhance with contrast since both vasogenic edema and contrast enhancement are due to blood-brain barrier disruption. Now let's look at the appearance of a primary brain tumor, specifically a glioblastoma on T2 flare and T2 weighted images. On the T2 flare image seen here, the red arrows point to the hyperintense area of the tumor lesion itself. On this slide, green arrows outline the extensive vasogenic edema surrounding the glioblastoma. Vasogenic edema appears white or hyperintense on T2 flare and T2 weighted images. Brain tumors tend to disrupt the blood-brain barrier resulting in seepage of fluid around the tumor. And because the white matter is spongy or less dense than the compact gray matter, the fluid of vasogenic edema tends to track only in the white matter, resulting in this finger-like projections or finger-like projections appearance of the vasogenic edema on brain imaging. On the same T2 flare image of this patient with glioblastoma, the yellow arrow is pointing to the area of central necrosis of the tumor. We perform T1 weighted MRI images in patients with suspected brain tumor to determine if there is enhancement with gadolinium contrast. On this slide, you see T1-weighted MRI images of the same patient we previously saw um, with abnormalities on T2 flare. And notice on T1 without gadolinium contrast, the green arrow pointing to a hypodense lesion, typical of T1. On this slide, the yellow arrow is pointing to an area that has mixed colors. There's an element of hyperintensity if necrosis occurs in a brain tumor, there may be areas of increase or decrease signal due to blood products at different stages within the lesion. When we add gadolinium contrast to a T1 weighted image in a patient with a brain tumor, there is typically enhancement, that is a whiteness or hyperintensity surrounding the tumor. This is due to leakage of the contrast or dye around the tumor due to blood-brain barrier disruption. So in other words, the reason for enhancement with contrast is exactly the same as the reason for vasogenic edema. The tumor causes blood-brain barrier disruption, which leads to vasogenic edema, best seen on T2-weighted image and flare, and shows gadolinium contrast enhancement best seen on a T1 with gadolinium enhancement given IV. Now let's look at the appearance of meningiomas on CT and MRI brain. Meningiomas are benign, that is to say non-cancerous tumors of dural tissue. Rarely, meningiomas can grow and cause life-threatening mass effect. Most meningiomas found on brain imaging are actually incidental and asymptomatic. The three images on this slide are from the same patient at around the same time. The image to the left is CT without contrast. Because meningiomas are very calcified, they usually appear white on, or hyperdense on CT scan. You can see that this patient has two meningiomas, 
the one more anteriorly is along the falks between the two frontal lobes. The lesion more posteriorly is behind the cerebellum, likely along the tentorium cerebelli. They are white without contrast because they are calcified and so appear to be hyperdense on CT. The middle image for the same patient is the MRI T1 without contrast. The posterior fossa meningioma actually is not visible without contrast on the MRI T1. But if you give contrast to the MRI T1, the posterior fossa meningioma enhances like most other tumors and is white or hyperintense on the T1 with contrast. On this slide, we see two axial T2 flare MRI images of a patient with multiple sclerosis. Here, the orange arrows are pointing to the multiple hyperintense lesions in the paraventricular white matter. And on this slide, the blue arrows point out that the lesions are typically ovular in shape with their long axes perpendicular to the ventricles. Recall that lesions in multiple sclerosis are best seen on T2 flare or T2 weighted images, as we see here on the T2 flare. In multiple sclerosis, sagittal T2 flare MRI images can be very useful because the ovular paraventricular lesions are perpendicular to the ventricle and thus have the appearance of fingers projecting from the ventricles. They're often called Dawson's fingers after the radiologists who first described this imaging phenomenon. Here, the orange arrows are pointing to Dawson's fingers, the paraventricular lesions they give this finger-like appearance coming out of the corpus callosum. While flare and T2 weighted images are best for detecting chronic multiple sclerosis lesions, they cannot determine if an MS plaque is new or old. For this, we need T1 weighted images with and without contrast. As the red arrows show on this slide, new MS lesions or plaques enhance with gadolinium contrast due to blood-brain barrier disruption and are seen best on T1-weighted images with contrast compared to T1 without contrast. In patients with end-stage multiple sclerosis, the brain on MRI in here MRI T2 flare shows marked diffuse cerebral atrophy and extensive white matter hyperintensities. Deep white matter hyperintense lesions are common in patients with migraine with aura. They are often called unidentified bright objects or UBOs. They're white on T2 and T2 flare located at the gray white junction not around the ventricles. They are not paraventricular like an MS. They tend to be small, round, not ovular like an MS, with indistinct borders, and yet they are often confused with multiple sclerosis plaques or strokes, and are sometimes labeled as evidence of small vessel disease or arteritis or vasculitis. In fact, they have no clinical relevance, and further evaluation is not necessary, and one must reassure the patient that these dots, these hyperintense lesions, so-called lesions on the MRI, are of no consequence. In case you did not see them on the previous slide, the red arrows on this slide point to the multiple hyperintense lesions at the gray white junction, consistent only with unidentified bright objects or UBOs of migraine, not with stroke and not with MS. On this slide, the three different causes of subcortical white matter hyperintense lesions on T2 flare are compared on this together. 
On the left, ischemic changes. Note that they are, tend to be paraventricular in location. They tend to be round or ovular, but if they are ovular, they are parallel to the ventricular axis. This patient also has patchy white matter changes in the posterior corona radiata called the forceps major uh, and the anterior uh, for uh, corona radiata called the forceps minor. This is usually due to chronic hypertension. On the image in the middle, most consistent with MS, the hyperintense lesions are also paraventricular, but they are ovular with their axes perpendicular to the ventricular axis. And on the right, the small lesions, hyperintense lesions, are actually at the gray-white junction. They're not paraventricular, and they tend to be round and have indistinct or blurred borders, consistent with migraine UBOs. Now let's try to appreciate the appearance of diffuse cerebral atrophy on brain imaging. We will look at MRI flare axial images in two different patients. A patient with, who has normal MRI, a 41-year-old with normal cognition, and a patient who has diffuse cerebral atrophy, a 71-year-old with dementia. We will look more carefully at the differences over the next few slides. Comparing images A in both patients, the normal patient to the patient with diffuse cerebral atrophy, we can see that in the normal patient, the ciliary fissure is normal in size, where it is enlarged in the patient with dementia and atrophy. The temporal horn is barely visible in the normal patient, whereas it is enlarged in the patient with dementia and atrophy. And in the normal patient, cisterns around the brainstem are normal in size, whereas they are more prominent and large in the patient with diffuse cerebral atrophy and dementia. Comparing slice B for both patients, we see in the normal 41-year-old that the frontal horn is a normal size, rather small. For the 71-year-old with dementia, however, the frontal horn is enlarged. In the normal 41-year-old without cognitive difficulties, the ciliary fissure is normal size. In the 71-year-old with dementia, the ciliary fissures are enlarged, very prominent. In the 41-year-old normal patient, the atrium, also known as a trigone of the lateral ventricle, is normal in size, very small, whereas it is quite enlarged in the patient with diffuse cerebral atrophy and dementia. Comparing slice C for both patients, one can see in the normal 41-year-old that the lateral ventricle is quite small and normal in size, whereas the lateral ventricle is quite enlarged in the patient with diffuse cerebral atrophy. Ventricular enlargement due to atrophy is called hydrocephalus ex vacuo. The normal patient has normal sulci. The size of the sulci is normal, small little wrinkles. Whereas in the patient with diffuse cerebral atrophy and dementia, the sulci are quite enlarged and prominent. Now let's look at the brain imaging appearance of hydrocephalus, also known as ventriculomegaly, enlarged ventricles, and compare the two different types of hydrocephalus. The hydrocephalus due to enlarged ventricles per se, and the hydrocephalus due to atrophy of adjacent tissue called hydrocephalus ex vacuo. The three upper CT scan images are from a 49-year-old with subarachnoid hemorrhages. These images show large ventricles with compressed or blood-filled sulci and cisterns. Their ventricles are large, but the sulci are not. And the sulci are either not present at all because they're compressed due to increased intracranial pressure, or they're filled with blood in the case of a subarachnoid hemorrhage. The three images at the bottom are from a 71-year-old with dementia, dementing illness. And in this case, there are large ventricles and enlarged sulci, including the sylvian fissure as well as the sulci. The combination of large ventricles with large sulci and cisterns and fissures is called 
hydrocephalus ex vacuo. And in this case, hydrocephalus per se is not the concern. It is the dementing illness, the degenerative disease that is the primary concern. After viewing this presentation, you should be able to accomplish the stated learning objectives reproduced on this slide for your review. This is the end of this presentation, a production of DLG Insight, Innovative Neuroscience Ideas and Thoughts on Education.